him. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. James back to the stage who will introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you, Jamila, uh, and thank you all. I'm just going to take a minute. Um, as far as Dr. Burkle's full body of work, just Google. You know, we don't have to stand up here and repeat. But if you don't know who Dr. Burkle is, you may be at the wrong meeting. And that's the impact the man has had. The reason uh, this concept came up of having uh, a yearly lecture in his honor was because no matter who I ran into out there, Dr. Burkle was my mentor. And that, that speaks everything. So I will leave it to the internet for you all to fill in the gaps. Now, I would like to introduce the person who's been selected as the first Merkel uh, uh, delivery. And it's gonna be on the short side today because this was an add-on after the conference uh, initial planning was done. Uh, again, Dr. Blank, illustrious background. You can find out most of what he's done and, and his accomplishments on the internet. Suffice it to say, he was the 39th Surgeon General of the United States. And since then, uh, went on to be uh, the president of North Texas University and went on to find, uh, found uh, with Dr. Martin from uh, Health Affairs Days, a uh, consulting uh, firm, which has been very successful and uh, very active. His current position, he's the president of an organization called FAMER. We have spent the morning listening to people about breaking down silos. I spoke to Dr. Blank in the bathroom, that's where you meet people. And it was like deja vu all over again, both for him and for I. For 20 years, we've been saying we're gonna come together and maybe, maybe, this time we'll make a little progress. But without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Blank. And the reason he's connected with Dr. Burkle is his current work, which is a, a footprint, a global footprint, which was very near and dear to the heart of Dr. Burkle. And this has to do with ECFMGs and an organization called FAMER, which I think we all need to learn about. With that, Dr. Blank. Well, thank you very, very much. And, and, and I will tell you, it's truly an honor to be the uh, uh, first uh, speaker for the uh, Skip Burkle Distinguished Lecture. Skip is a uh, colleague, a friend, uh, a hero, as Jim said, a mentor, uh, an inspiration to all of us and brings together. Uh, it's amazing when you look at his bio, and I'll just stop after this, uh, how he brings together disaster medicine, public health, pediatrics, emergency medicine, psychiatry, all of it together and so much more. So uh, it is really uh, an honor for me to be here. Well, with that, I'm gonna talk about a couple of organizations that you may or may not be aware of and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I do in global health. And, and I hope this will uh, tell you about a community you may or may not be uh, very aware of, uh, as well as suggest some possible collaborations in the future. Now, let's see. I tend to be technology challenged. Ha, ah, how about that? So Int Health is, uh, is an organization you don't know about because it was just formed uh, six months ago. Uh, and it has come together to bring ECFMG and FAMER together these are organizations dealing with international medical graduates and global medical education and research. So I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but go to ECFMG and FAMER. You can see that we share values 
we have been merged, or we were separate organizations, so that we could potentially collaborate uh, and bring together all the elements of the global medical community, as well as the contributions that the international medical graduates make to uh, our community. And during the COVID epidemic, uh, I will tell you that a lot of the medical work done in ICUs and so forth were done by IMGs. Uh, and without them, we would be uh, certainly less well off. So what's the Education Commission on Foreign Medical Graduates? Most of you have heard about that. Uh, it was formed in the 50s by the American Medical Association and a few other organizations to do prime source verification of credentials. Because before that, people could come on visas or what have you, get their residencies, train, and uh, either stay here, go back to their countries. And it was felt that a, new, a, a more formalized system needed to be put into place. So the Education Commission on Foreign Medical Graduates was formed to do prime source verification, to administer an English test for those who were not native English speakers, even those who are native English speakers must take the test. Uh, and we administer the state licensing examinations, the, the uh, uh, National Board of Medical Examiners, uh, USMLE medical licensing exam. When international medical graduates go through all of this, they become ECFMG certified, and only those who are ECFMG certified may apply for residency in the United States. <clears throat> you will not be surprised, at least some of you won't be, to know that a little over 25% of the physicians practicing in the United States are international medical graduates. I was surprised to learn that in my specialty, internal medicine, 55% of residents in internal medicine are international medical graduates. So to say that we could not do without them uh, is, is a, 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 a correct statement. I would recommend that this is a community we need to reach out to. There's a variety of ways to do it. Uh, and uh, it, as, as Jim said, again, we don't wanna be in silos, we wanna reach out. This is a community that can add to what we do in this country but let's not limit ourselves to this country. ECFMG in 1920 said, you know, we're doing very well, but what are we giving back? What are we doing for the rest of the global community in terms of medical education, in terms of research, in terms of all the kinds of things that uh, we hope we're about? And so FAMER was born, a separate foundation. FAMER stands for the foundation for the advancement of international medical education and research. Took me two days to memorize that. Uh, finally did, so now I can say it. Um, it is no longer a foundation because as was shown in the first two slides, uh, InTealth has taken FAMER under its wing and it's now one of the two operating arms of InTealth, ECFMG being one, FAMER being the other. So we collaborate on research which we do on um, health workforce, uh, workforce migration, uh, all sorts of things uh, that I'll point out to you uh, as I describe FAMER. So it was formed in 2000 uh, by ECFMG. It, there's something on the screen, so I can't read this here, so I keep looking up, forgive me. Uh, advances professional education worldwide, and I'll tell you about that. Uh, analyzes needs and, and uh, contributions of IMGs, uh, provides a lot of information in directories. We, for example, do the World Directory on Medical Schools uh, in collaboration with the World Federation of Medical Education. We have four focal areas, as you see here, FAMER Global, uh, which I'll talk about has institutes in 10 countries in, plus one in Philadelphia has uh, international medical graduate support, world resources, that's the directories, uh, and then the research I've uh, briefly talked about. So let's talk about FAMER Global first. This is our biggest or, uh, organizational entity. And uh, you can see the institutes we have in Indonesia, China, India, Egypt, 
uh, Uganda in Chile, plus our uh, institute in uh, Philadelphia. We have trained over 2,000 FAMER fellows in faculty development. So what's faculty development? It's competency-based curriculum development, it's leadership, it's project management, it's research um, uh, tools. It's all the kinds of things that a physician, a nurse, a social worker, anybody that's involved in medical education uh, might need to provide that. Uh, and obviously we do it worldwide. We are considering opening it up to a few faculty from the United States. So far, we have none, not done that. We limit it to uh, faculty from, typically we, we try to focus on uh, less developed uh, countries or areas uh, and uh, this seems to uh, have been very popular. We have, I cannot tell you how many applications for another FAMER Institute. Uh, so we are expanding and we hope to get to uh, as many as 20, but that's gonna take about uh, uh, five or 10 years to, uh, to get there. This is the FAMER International um, Graduate Support Activity, FIGS. Uh, and what we do here is try to bring to bear things that will assist international medical graduates coming into this country. The most exciting thing, and this is a, a new feature that we're uh, putting out, is we have developed a module for an introduction to the electronic medical record in the United States. We give it to IMGs who have been accepted to residency free of charge. This is just support that we do for them. Uh, I have taken it, and yes, this will be a surprise to some, I have managed to get through it. Uh, it took me three hours, it usually takes people two. But um, this is a very sophisticated tool uh, with videos of how to use it, with uh, all sorts of assists in it. We also, in the introduction, discuss things that many of the international graduates uh, aren't aware of, such as HIPAA. Uh, privacy and, and those kinds of things that uh, uh, we want to make sure they're they're aware of. And this was done, by the way, at the request of program directors in the United States. Um, we we uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a little horse here. Um, we have found this to be very popular. We piloted it this past um, academic year, and next year we will give it to all of the. Uh, international medical graduates who are coming into residency. By the way, that number is somewhere around 8,000 per year. Uh, and for those applying to residency, it's about 9,000 because 80% of those applying for residency match comparing, compared to about 94% for uh, USMD grads, 92% for USDO grads. Uh, so. It's a very, very good uh, representation. And uh, most of those, even those not matched, eventually do get their residency in the United States. They may have to try a couple of times, but uh, they do it. And there is some criticism or at least concern that, well, IMGs are taking residency positions away from US grads. No, they're not. Uh, yeah, maybe in a specific specialty they might be, but the point is we still, have more residency positions in the United States than we have total graduates, MD, DO, IMGs. Uh, so you may have to skew your uh, residency choice. You may not get into orthopedics, uh, but you can get a residency and uh, eventually virtually everybody does. Multiple choice quiz based on physical exam of patient. Can you imagine, this is MCQ. Can you imagine doing a physical exam online I couldn't, but in fact, oh, thank you very much. In fact, uh, <laughs> the person heading this has developed it. I took it and I, I did okay. I won't say I was, uh, I was superb, but how do you do it online? You have pictures, you have videos, you have uh, auscultation, you have sounds. So you can do just about everything except palpation. Uh, and one of these days we'll figure that out as well. Uh, what we're doing with this are allowing IMGs to uh, take it as an extra credential uh, so that they can uh, demonstrate competency in this area. Program directors have expressed some interest in using it as a way to assess trainees in their, uh, their program as well. 
And then finally, uh, we're comparing the uh, pathways exam. Uh, most of you know that we had uh, simulated patients, you know, actors, uh, and we did a, a real-time um, patient examination uh, test uh, for both U.S. graduates as well as uh, IMGs. That was stopped during COVID, so we developed other methodologies uh, for assessing competency in uh, history-taking physical examination, and we're looking at uh, whether it really uh, measures what we hope it will. Now we come to the directories. And uh, first of all is the World Directory of Medical School. Anybody can subscribe to this. Uh, it's actually free, so you don't have to subscribe. You can get it. Well, you do have to subscribe. We need to know who you are and where you are, but you can get this. And it is an up-to-the-date listing of every medical school in the world. Uh, this is a daunting task because there's probably uh, 100 to 150 new medical schools every year. It seems like every week, but it's only every year. Uh, and then there's some number that uh, fail and go away, uh, but we do this. Then we also have DORA, which is the directory of organizations that recognize and accredit medical schools because we're very interested in accreditation. Uh, and that again is, uh, is available to you. We work with the uh, uh, World Federation of Medical Education and lastly is GGPEP, which I contend is the coolest acronym ever. GGPEP stands for the Global Guide to Physician Education and Practice. And it's a description of the health education system in every country of the world. We've done 51 countries so far, including India, uh, which took about half the time because it's huge. Uh, but this is something that uh, we'll get up probably to 120, 130, some of the smaller schools we won't, uh, won't deal with. Uh, and it's going to be a resource for regulators, uh, for anybody interested in medical education on a global sense. And this is, uh, this is a, a very, very cool thing that we're doing. And finally, the research. I'm not going to go into it in great detail, simply to say that we look at healthcare workforce, uh, regulatory scope assessment tools. Uh, we publish articles on this everywhere. And it's something that as we talked about research this morning, uh, it occurred to me, this is an area ripe for collaboration uh, because in our faculty development, uh, we really emphasize public health. Uh, we really emphasize a lot of the things that we're all about here. And the research we do has to do with that too. Uh, in Africa, in China, in Indonesia, in India, and so forth and so on. So with that, I will end my all too brief talk. Jimmy said, I can't talk more than I already have and say, thank you very, very much. I appreciate your attendance. Take care. <laughs>